Welcome everyone to Central Baptist Clifton Springs live stream service today. No, we still aren't there yet, but we're moving along. We will be meeting in person soon, I hope and pray. But whether we meet online or in person, we can still worship our awesome God and Saviour. And we can do that together. Today, this service has a few more boxes than normal in it, in it. They're not empty. They're filled with people. Our prayer is a Zoom prayer and our kids' video is made up of many children's faces singing the greatest blessing ever blessed. It has been running through my head day and night since I heard it. A little later, Lynn Taylor will lead us in the Bible reading today. I'd like to take a moment just now to pray for the Greeny family, a family who have suffered the great loss of their little toddler, Anna, who drowned at the Port Arlington Pier on Thursday. She was two. Please join me as we pray for this family. Loving Heavenly Father, you're a God who meets us in our grief. I lift up to you this morning and as mum and dad, Billy and Patrick, and their three other children. Lord, at times like this, we don't know what to pray as our words stand as nothing beside a loss like this. Lord, we ask that you move very, very close beside them and help them. Comfort, the, comfort them like they have never been comforted before. Be with them as they negotiate all of the arrangements that have to be made. Hold them tight and draw them together in your love. Lord, we pray for the fishermen and the emergency services people that have been deeply affected by this tragedy also, as is the whole Port Arlington community. We offer our prayers as one body for this precious family this morning. I pray this in Jesus' precious and comforting name. Amen. It's in these times that we feel weak and lacking. But please join me as we give praise to the one who can give us what we need when we are at our weakest. Join me as Melinda and Bree lead us in singing. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Let the blind say, I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me.
Come on. 
Let me introduce Georgia, Marita and Jeff this morning. They have so kindly and bravely committed to leading us in a Zoom prayer this morning. They may be in different boxes on our screen, but they are well and truly part of one body of Christ, which is here at Central Baptist. You at home are part of that body. This is our very first Zoom pastoral prayer. However, it's not uncommon in our worship services prior to the COVID restrictions to have many people speak into our prayers as we pray for the world, our lives and our community. So this morning, please join in at home while Marita, Georgia and Jeff lead us today. Please join with me as we pray for families, our children, young people and parents. Lord, you are the same yesterday, today and forever, and your steadfast love never ceases. We are living in changing and uncertain times and we ask for your protection and care of our families. For parents, we ask that you grant them wisdom, strength and patience as they guide their children's learning from home. For many, this means juggling work commitments with guiding their children's learning. And we ask for an extra measure of grace and understanding as families manage their days. For the children missing the routine of school, their friends, struggling with learning from home, we pray for comfort and a sense of calm so they can achieve the best they can. For our young people in secondary school, we pray for wisdom and clarity as they persevere in their own online learning. And we do think of those we know doing their final years, year 11 and 12, in a year that has had so many challenges. Be their help as they approach the final weeks of study and their end of year terms, exams. May they put their trust and hope in you. Lord, in these days of restrictions due to COVID, we ask that you strengthen relationships within families and cultivate a sense of peace and harmony. May they be precious memories of closeness and, a new, and new experiences shared. We acknowledge this Father's Day, the significant contribution of fathers in parenting, guiding and nurturing children. We know that in all things, Lord, you work for good of those who love you and have been called according to your purposes. Lord, we ask you will bless families with your steadfast love. Amen. Dear God, thank you for all the generations in our church, but especially the older generations in our church and community. Thank you for the wisdom and kindness they bring to our church family. Thank you for the encouragement they bring to young families and children. Please keep them safe and healthy during these tough times. We pray especially for the older members of our church who may be feeling isolated from family and friends. Please help them know that they are not alone. And once this virus passes, we will we can all come together again. Until then, please help them stay connected to their family and friends through phone calls, letters, or other forms of communication. We can't wait for the day where we can all generations can come together again and see each other. Amen. Loving Father, we, we want to thank you for the way you've gathered us together as a church family to share your love with our community, to be able to worship you and serve you and honour you together. And loving Father, we would pray for all in our community today who are seeking you with heart, soul and mind and strength. We ask that you would pour out your special love on them. We ask that you would touch our lives with your Holy Spirit Fill our lives with your love and truth. And Lord, make us channels of healing and wholeness, especially to those we encounter this week who are broken or lonely, unwell, afraid, or just don't know which way to turn. And Lord, we would especially pray for those in our church family at this point in time with the need of your healing, the strength, comfort and guidance. We especially ask for successful surgery for Melinda this week. Physical strength, healing and guidance throughout the ongoing treatment and give to her a very special deep awareness of your presence with her at this time. We pray for a good outcome for Lorraine during her current medical treatment. 
and give daily physical and spiritual strength to Doug. Mm -hmm. Provide guidance, wisdom and renewed strength for Robbie. Enable Izzy to make a full recovery from her recent surgery. And Lord, comfort Pramrila in her time of grief. Mm -hmm. And Father, today we especially thank you for our fathers and we pray for all fathers. Lord, just flood them with a sense of your fatherly love for them. And we pray especially for those who are feeling the, the absence of their children or grandchildren with them at this time. And just give to them a, a joy and a strength of your love for them. Mm. And Lord, now we would pray for ourselves. We keep our eyes fixed on Christ, the source of all faith, hope and love. And fill and empower our lives so that the light of your mercy and presence may reach into all the corners of our lives as well as all the corners of our world. Mm. Lord, we pray these prayers in the name of Christ. Amen. The reading for today is number 6, 22 to 27. The Priestly Blessing. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. Thank you, Lynn, for the reading of God's word today. This morning I've begun with the benediction. Lynn just read it. So I pose the question, have I begun at the end or the start of the service? If benedictions are only for the end of the service, can we go home now? Oh. Sorry, you already are at home. I almost forgot. Don't turn me off though. The very first words in the Bible are, in the beginning God created. He created everything by his word. The Gospel of John confirms that he was the word at the beginning. And we just sang beautiful, true words. You were the word at the beginning one with God, the Lord's most, Lord Most High, your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, our King. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The last words in the Bible are this. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with God's people. Amen. Take a look. They're the last words in Revelation. Those final words basically say the wash up of all existence is when it's all said and done, it is Jesus, God's people, and his grace. Jesus, he is one with God. God's people, us, if you have given your heart to Jesus Christ, you are God's people and his grace is poured out on you. Since this pandemic reared its ugly head and began to disrupt our lives, the lives of the entire world, I began to finish our services with a benediction, a blessing. I didn't always do that. The prompting of the Holy Spirit just seemed to say, Give them something special of me to go into the world and to go into their week with. So what's a benediction anyway? Is it just a way of finishing off a service, a nice punctuation mark, sort of a full stop to our worship time? No, a benediction is far more than that. Benedictions from scripture are often read or recited near or close to the end of a service. In this context, benedictions embody a call to unity, to faith, to joy, and to oneness among the brethren. Reciting a benediction is meant to encourage believers and stimulate joy and commitment to God. 
Many believers find meditating on benedictions during their quiet times is a soothing balm which deepens the spirit and provides support to the ailing heart and strengthens the faltering soul. Benedictions can be a remarkable source of healing because the words themselves are life. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, The Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I have spoken to you, they are full of the Spirit and life. So no, the benediction is far more than just a way of adjourning our service. The more I looked, the more I looked at benedictions, the more the realisation came to me that they contain what you need for the part of your life that is contained in between your first breath and your last breath. There are many benedictions used in the Bible, but the one, the absolutely one that is complete, you will find in Numbers 6, 22 to 27. Tim Keller described it like this, the benediction pronounced by God on his people is the meaning of your whole life. If you understand the benediction, when it is said to you, your whole life should flash before your very eyes. These words, you've got to realise, are directly from God's lips, spoken to Moses, spoken to you. Maybe he spoke it to the Israelites first. God told him, to have the priests bless his people with these words every single time they finish their worship service in the tabernacle. After the sacrifices had been given, after they had met the requirements of the law, the benediction, the blessing was given. <clears throat> you would think these words would be worn out if they had been used over and over again like that to his people. But I don't think they are. Allow me to pronounce them over you. To you. Now. In a moment. Jesus has done his work of grace on the cross for us. Let me pronounce words from the very lips of God to you. Let me pronounce them over you. Concerning you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Then this side of the cross, God says, I put my name on my people on you, I will bless you. Now they are good words. Good words for your heart. They are good words for your soul. They are good words for your future, for your present well-being right now. They are good words to deal with your past. That's the grace. I know there is no other place that I would rather be. No other place than immersed in this blessing with my Saviour Jesus. How about you? Benediction. Benediction means good word. The Latin beni means good. Diction, word, good word. This is a good word from God and he pronounces it over his people. He pronounces it over you. He pronounces it over his people at the start and at the end and all of the space in between. He speaks it over you into your entire life. It saturates scripture. It is the longing of God's heart 
for it to be so with you. When God created all things, everything that there is, six times after creating something, he stood back and he said, it is good. Twice he said, it is good, and the Bible says he blessed it. What was he doing? What was he doing when, when he did that? Was he standing back, hands on his hips, if God has hips, and making an appraisal of his work? No. We are talking about God here. We might, we might do that, but God, who is omnipotent and omniscient, already knows that what he made is good because everything that he makes and does is very, very good. Why does he stand back and give it his good word then? What is he doing? He is giving what he has made benediction. He is blessing what he has made. He was enjoying it. He was delighting in it. So first of all, blessing means to delight in something. The other place we can go in the Bible to see to give us an idea behind the idea of blessing is to look how far at how fathers bless their children at the end of their lives. In those times, when a man was about to die, the father of the family, he would gather his children around his, his bedside and he would bless them. You see, you see this happen a few times in the Bible. Jacob does it in Genesis 49, and so does Isaac in Genesis 27. And there's a real story attached to that blessing. On one hand, when the father would bless his children, he would be wishing them well. He would be saying, I long for your good. I long for your prosperity. You may be like this. You may be like that. You may have this characteristic. You may have that characteristic. So on the one hand, he is delighting in the child and he is longing for their prosperity and their good. But that's not all that he does. On the other hand, it is more than just a subjective blessing. It was a practical, objective blessing also. He doesn't just wish for their good. He actually divides up everything that he has and he bestows his property on his children to achieve that good. He commits his wealth and his estate to the child in order to achieve that good. That's what blessing means. Maybe we are beginning to get what it means for God to say to any human being, I bless you. For God to say, I bless you, is to say, I delight in you. Not only do I delight in you and wish you well, I am committed with all of my power to achieving your good. I don't just wish that you have a good life. I'm going to achieve that good and I'm going to be expensively present with you all of your life. That is to say, I am willing to pay the price, whatever it takes, for your good. That's why it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. That's the keeping of you. He doesn't just wish you well, he achieves the good in you by giving his all to you. Everything you need to get you there. He blesses us. And he keeps us. Verse 25 and 26 goes on to say, The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. What does that mean? The face of God is his relational presence. Do you know the difference between the face of God and just the general presence of God? 
Let me give you an example. I suppose it's a bit like this. Have you ever maybe gone to a get together with a group of friends or family and sat at a big table? Maybe there are 10 people at the table. That sort of thing um, used to happen and I suppose it will happen again, so take heart. But imagine, 10 people at the table, all eating, you have a sense of presence with all of those people who are there. You are present to them. You can speak with them, any of them, if you like. In a way, you are present to all of them. But maybe, at the moment, your face is turned only to one person and you're having a conversation with him or her, a deep conversation, an intimate conversation about their life. It is a conversation of importance, one in which your presence, your ear, your character, your focus and your attention is fully committed to that person. You are present with all the others, but your presence to that person has your face turned just to him or her. It is far more personal than the presence you are having with the other people at the table. That's what the face means. For God's face to be turned upon you and to shine, which is the idea of a smile, to shine, which is the idea of joy and radiance. For God's face to be turned to you and to shine upon you means to have an intimate personal relationship with God. How incredible is this? What a blessing. But there is a problem here. How can this be? Moses' head would have been done in by God telling him to have this said to the people, to tell him to get all of the priests to tell this to the people. You see... When Moses was up on the Mount of Sinai, getting the tablets, getting the law, at one point he turned to God and he said, let me see you, show me yourself. It was actually a request for intimacy. What does God say? He says, he says, no, no one can look upon my face and live. Why not? Although God is present everywhere, we have lost his face. That's one of the main points of the Bible. We had his face in the Garden of Eden, but when we turned away from him and decided to do our own thing, when we decided to be our own saviours, our own lords, our own masters of our own souls, Yes, when we believe the lie that if we just look inside ourselves, we will be able to find everything that we need. We lost the face of God, not just his presence, nor not his presence, but his face. The love relationship, the personal relationship. After that, God said, no one can look on my face and live. He was not just having a grump at us because we had been disobedient and sinning. He was saying, I am holy, absolutely holy. My absolute holiness and glory is inherently incapable of dwelling with sin. They are inherently incompatible fire and water if you get them together either the fire is going to evaporate the water or the water is going to put out the fire but they will not stay together they are inherently incompatible he's saying there is absolutely no way that sin can dwell with holiness or holiness can dwell with sin and my face is a relational gate to my holy and glorious character. 
So how can it be? Make his face shine upon us. Turn his face towards us. Is this blessing too good to be true? Is this a divine trick to finally destroy our sinful humankind? Get rid of us, get us out of the way. A trick that will catch us so that God won't have to run after us and get us. It sounds too good to be true. You know what they say. If it sounds too good to be true, then it probably is. Well, don't drop your bundle. Don't take a human approach here. Don't lose it now. This blessing came from the lips of God to be heard by your ears and spoken into your life. No trick. It's all contained in the blessing, the benediction, the good word of God for you. Remember the words and keep you. He gives us what is required for the blessing to succeed. He gives us all that he has to achieve his blessing on us. And at the end of verse 25, he says, and be gracious to you. He's going to give us his grace. The grace, the grace, it's God's grace. It's his son, Jesus Christ, and him paying the price with his death to wipe away our sins. He wipes away the sins which stop us from having his face. Our relationship is absolutely compatible with him. His sacrifice did it all for us. Moses didn't know, but we do know because we know Hebrews 10. And it says, day after day, every priest stands. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. But when the priest, this priest, Jesus Christ, had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. For Moses... It had to be pronounced over and over after the animal sacrifices were done. But for us, this side of the cross, this side of the resurrection of Jesus, this blessing can truly fill, can truly overtake and direct our lives. Jesus, God's people and his grace, together in the place that God has prepared for us, is the final state, then amen. The final wash-up that leaves God's people as white as snow. The benediction ends with, so I will put my name on you, on my people, and I will bless them. He brings his people into his family and he gives them his name. He puts his name on them. He puts his name on you. The relationship is secure and sound. It is subjective beyond what you could ever imagine. It is objective way beyond anything you could ever expect. When God speaks his blessing over you, when it is from his very lips, it expresses his love for us. He wants us to know him so well through his benediction for us that he will, as it says in Ephesians, that we will grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know his love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with every measure of all the fullness of God. Let's pray. Loving Father, our true Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us how much you care for us and love us. 
may we participate in receiving this amazing blessing from your very lips. May we begin to know you more. May our relationship with you grow and develop into maturity in your ways as we live out life as your children, as we live it out together. This I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. truly is above every other name. I hope you have been blessed by this blessing that came from God's lips. Now let me bring a blessing upon a blessing this morning. Paul spoke it over the Thessalonians. Allow me to pray it over you this morning. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word. Amen. 
Go in peace, knowing God is with you always. There is no full stop when it comes to God. Go well.